Campi Flegre's last eruption occurred in 1538, dramatically building a new volcanic cone, Monte Nuovo, rising approximately 130 metres above the landscape in just a single week. This remarkable event reshaped the region, burying villages, altering coastlines, and profoundly impacting the local population. This detailed simulation reconstructs the eruption timeline, vividly illustrating the geological processes and precursors, including intense seismic activity, significant ground swelling, and rapid magma water interactions that preceded, accompanied, and followed this extraordinary volcanic event. Monte Nuovo, Italian for New Mountain, is a cinder cone volcano that formed within the Campi Flegre caldera near Pozzuoli, west of Naples in Italy. This week-long eruption, occurring from September 29 to October 6 in 1538, occurred after approximately 3,000 to 3,500 years of quiescence in the area. The event holds great significance as one of the first volcanic eruptions in modern times to be observed and documented in detail by numerous witnesses. Don't forget to click on that subscribe button, hit the bell icon and like this video, as it's the best way to support this channel. And if you enjoy it, consider sharing it around. Prior to the 1538 eruption, the Campi Flegre region exhibited clear signs of unrest, including pronounced ground swelling and intense seismic activity. After centuries of gradual subsidence, the caldera floor began rising in the decades leading up to 1538. Residents of Pozzuoli noticed new land emerging from the sea as early as 1502. The uplift accelerated in the 1530s. By late 1538, the coastal ground in the area of the future eruption had been pushed upward on the order of several metres, displacing the shoreline by hundreds of metres. Contemporary reports suggest a total uplift of about 7 metres near the vent area shortly before the eruption. Analysis of Roman ruins and shoreline changes indicates the ground may have risen roughly 12 metres between 1000 and 1538, including a rapid 4 metre surge immediately prior to the eruption. This phenomenon of slow uplift signalled magma or hydrothermal fluids accumulating beneath the caldera. Unusual earthquake activity accompanied the ground swelling. Starting in the early 1530s, tremors were felt intermittently around Pozzuoli. A first major swarm struck in 1534, and earthquakes continued on and off for the next four years. In September 1538, the seismicity intensified dramatically. On September 28 alone, about 20 tremors were felt between dawn and dusk. These swarms caused alarm and some damage in the area. Historical records indicate that buildings in Pozzuoli suffered cracking and damage from repeated quakes even before the eruption began. Seismologists note that the only comparable earthquake swarms in Campi Flegre's recorded history were those of 1983-84, during a modern unrest episode, highlighting the significance of the 1530s seismic activity. Residents also reported other unusual phenomena in the weeks leading up to the eruption. Accounts describe the ground smoking, likely increased fumarolic steam or gas emissions in the Campi Flegre fields during the fall of 1538. Hot springs in the area, such as the renowned baths at Tripagoli, may have shown changes. Indeed, rising magma heating groundwater could have caused wells or springs to dry up or water to boil. By late September, the unrest had grown so evident that many locals grew anxious, and livestock became agitated. Eruption Timeline September 29, 1538 Eruption Onset On the evening of September 29, around 8pm, the accumulated pressure beneath Campi Flegre reached a breaking point. A fissure ruptured the ground in the area of maximum uplift, next to the village of Tripogoli on the shore of Lake Lucrino. Witnesses reported the blast of fire and pumice as the earth cracked open, accompanied by roiling black and white smoke. These initial explosions excavated the vent and began ejecting large amounts of tephra. The involvement of groundwater was immediately apparent. Much of the fallout came down as muddy ash rather than dry pumice, indicating magma water interaction in the opening phase. Within hours, an eruption column rose and lofted across a wide region, while pyroclastic surges, also known as base flows, spread radially around the vent. By the dawn of the 30th, Ashfall was coating the surrounding area heavily, 
Contemporary reports noted ash layers 30cm thick in Pozzuoli, 3km away, and 2cm even in Naples, 20km in distance, with fine ash carried as far as Calabria and Apulia, 200km to the southeast. The ash was wet, with accretionary lapilli, small ash balls, consistent with phreatomagmatic activity, which is when magma explodes on contact with water. Intense eruptive activity continued through the night and into the next day. September 30 to October 1st. The eruption was most vigorous during its first 24 to 48 hours. Eyewitnesses describe a quasi-continuous emission of dark ash clouds and flames from the vent, generating both a rising convective plume and ground-hugging pyroclastic flows. These pyroclastic density currents, fortunately, did not travel very far. They swept a few hundred metres from the vent, filling some nearby inlets with debris, but dissipated before reaching distant settlements. By the end of the first day, September 30, the bulk of the new volcanic cone had been built by accumulated fallout and pyroclastic deposits. In fact, chronicles note that within the first 12 hours, the cone was largely formed, rising rapidly to tens of metres high. After roughly two days of continuous eruptions, by early October 1st, the activity began to wane. A floating pumice raft up to 30 to 40 centimetres thick was observed on the surface of the Bay of Pozzuoli, composed of lightweight ejecta that had fallen into the sea. By the morning of October 1st, on Tuesday, the eruption paused and no ash was falling. At this time, some observers, including the Neapolitan physician Giacomo da Toledo, climbed a fresh cone to investigate. They peered into the crater and saw mud and water boiling in the crater bottom, and occasional spurts of stone, suggesting a shallow lava lake or a vigorously degassing hydrothermal system left in the vent. Essentially, the volcano entered a brief lull after the initial cataclysmic phase. October 3rd, 1538. Renewed explosion. After a two-day quiet interval, the eruption resumed in a sudden burst. Around 4pm on October 3rd, a strong explosion erupted from Monte Norvo's crater. This eruption produced cauliflower-shaped dark ash clouds and hurled large blocks and scoria out of the crater. Pyroclastic surges from this explosion swept out over the sea for a few kilometres, and a shower of volcanic blocks fell across the area. This was more likely a magmatic or dry blast following the earlier phreatomagmatic phase. Observers described red-hot rocks and globular ash clouds. After this 3rd of October explosion, activity quickly died down again. No significant eruption followed in the next couple of days. October 4th to 5th were largely quiet, aside from steam and minor ash venting. October 4th to 5th, 1538. Impacts on Pozzuoli. By October 4th, the devastation in the surrounding area was evident. An eyewitness account by Giulio Macesino describes Pozzuoli as nearly destroyed. About 90% of the buildings in the town had either collapsed or were heavily damaged due to the relentless earthquakes and the weight of ash fallout on roofs. Thick blankets of ash and lapilli covered the landscape around Monte Novo, burying vegetation and structures. Within a few kilometres of the vent, trees were scorched, uprooted or entombed in ash. The medieval town of Tripogoli, which had stood at the vent site, was completely obliterated. Its homes, a Roman bath complex, and even ancient ruins like Cicero's villa were buried under many metres of tuff and scoria, such that the village ceased to exist. Residents of the immediate area had evacuated as their homes became uninhabitable. Meanwhile, the volcanic cone, which would be named Monte Novo, loomed over the bay, still emitting steam but with greatly reduced activity. October 6, 1538. Final explosion and end. The eruption's last act came unexpectedly on Sunday, October the 6th. With the volcano seemingly calm, crowds of curious people ventured onto the cone that day. It was a Sunday and many from nearby areas came to inspect the phenomenon. Late that evening, around 10pm, a sudden powerful explosion tore through the cone without warning. This blast punched out in the south-southeast flank of Monte Novo's crater, ejecting a wave of hot scoria. Tragically, about 24 people on the volcano were killed instantly by this explosion. The deposits from this brief event were localised. 
A layer of coarse scoria, up to half a metre in diameter, was found on the south-southeast side of the cone. After this fatal blast, the eruption quickly subsided. No further major eruptions occurred. The vent settled down to fumarolic or gas venting activity. By October 7, 1538, the eruption was effectively over, leaving behind a steaming new mountain of loose tephra where a flat coastal plain had been only one week before. Over the course of this week-long eruption, Monte Norvo grew to an elevation of roughly 130 metres or 430 feet above its surroundings. The cone summit is 132 metres above sea level today. The eruption was entirely explosive, producing tephra, ash, pumice, lapilli, and volcanic blocks, but no significant lava flows. Most of the volume was deposited as tuff and scoria forming the cone and blanketing the area. The eruption began with a phreatomagmatic phase, the interaction of magma with water, evidenced by widespread fine ash, mud coating on deposits, and accretionary lapilli. The lower member of the deposit, from the first two days, is composed of bedded ash and pumice fallout, including wet surge deposits, and even contains foreign clasts, like bits of the Neapolitan yellow tuff and older caldera rock, shell fragments from the coastal lagoon, and even pieces of man-made materials, like brick and pottery, from Tripagoli that were blasted out. The later upper member deposits, from the October 3rd and 6th blasts, are coarser, dark scoria and block layers, indicating a drier, more magmatic eruptive style. Ashfall from Monte Norvo was recorded to have reached at least 50 to 60 kilometers away, and fine ash traveled hundreds of kilometers, though the most destructive effects were confined to a few kilometers radius. By the eruption's conclusion, the landscape had been radically altered. A new crater, 0.4 kilometers wide, sat where the village of Tripagoli had been, and the surrounding land was buried under grey ash and scoria up to several metres thick near the vent. The Monte Norvo eruption dramatically changed the local topography of the Campi Flagre area. The most obvious result was the creation of Monte Norvo itself, a cinder roughly 1 kilometre in base diameter and 130 metres high dominating the shoreline. This new mountain covered what used to be part of the Lucrino coastal area. The once much larger Lake Lucrino was partially filled in by erupted material, greatly reducing its size. The entire village of Tripagoli, famous for its ancient Roman thermal baths, was buried under the cone's ejector, up to 15 metres of tuff in places. All of Tripagoli's buildings and hot spring pools disappeared, and their exact locations are now lost beneath the volcanic deposits. The nearby Lake Averno remained intact but was separated from the sea by the new landforms. The coastline around Pozzuoli and Baia was altered. Some new land was added by the uplift and tephra deposition, while other sections subsided or were covered by volcanic debris. In the immediate aftermath, the area around Monte Norvo would have been a barren, grey ash field, with tree trunks and structures protruding from the ash a wasteland in stark contrast to the fertile, inhabited plain that existed only a week prior. The eruption's fallout devastated agriculture in the vicinity. Thick ash and lapilli likely destroyed crops and vineyards around Pozzuoli and Bagnoli for that season. Many trees were knocked down or burned, and the land was stripped of vegetation up to a few kilometres from the vent. The thermal spring systems in the area were profoundly affected. The famous healing springs of Tripagoli were gone, and it took centuries for new fumaroles and hot springs, like those at the nearby Salvatara, to establish a balance. For the local population, the destruction of Tripagoli and damage in Pozzuoli meant a loss of homes and infrastructure. Many residents had to relocate or rebuild. In the broader region, the event was terrifying, but relatively small in scale. Unlike a Great Plinian eruption, Monte Norvo did not cause famines or climate impacts. Ashfall in Naples was only a few centimetres, causing inconvenience but not catastrophic damage. Thus, aside from the immediate vicinity, life in most of Campania went on normally after 1538. The psychological impact, however, was significant. This was a striking reminder that the burning fields could come back to life after millennia, and it entered local law that a mountain had risen overnight. The quiescence after 1538 lasted until the 20th century. In the 1960s to 1980s, Campi Filgrei experienced renewed episodes of ground uplift and swarms of earthquakes, echoing the precursors of 1538. Notably in 1969-72, and again in 1982-84, to 84, 
Potswali's ground rose dramatically, on the order of 1.7 to 3 meters total, and thousands of small earthquakes struck. During the 1983 to 84 crisis, tens of thousands of residents were temporarily evacuated from Potswali as a precaution, because scientists recognized the pattern as very similar to the lead up to Monte Nuovo. And thus, this is the story of Campi Flegrei's most recent eruption, something that is sure to happen again in the future. I hope you found this as interesting as I did, and as always, thanks for watching. Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.